there's no reason to use a cheap disposable razor or pay a ridiculously high price for gimmicks. Make the smarter choice and join Dollar Shave Club like my boy Tim did. Have you seen him lately? No more neckbeard. It's beautiful. Get a close shave every time and you can't beat the convenience or the price. If you haven't tried Dollar Shave Club yet, you're missing out. It's an amazing shave at an affordable price. There's no smarter choice on the market. And right now, they're giving away a one-month trial of any of their razors for $1 with free shipping. And after that, it's just a few bucks a month. There's no long-term commitment, no hidden fees, and you cancel whenever you want. Get your dollar trial at dollarshaveclub.com slash greggy. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash greggy. I always remember growing up, I thought, man, if I could have an arcade cabinet in my house, yeah. I'll be rich. That'd you be know? so cool. Yeah, and now so cool. it's like, uh, that's it's just such a hipster thing that people just do. And it's like, I mean, honestly, over time, I think video games might be the worst investment for collectibles. Do you, do you agree with that? I mean, I don't know. Are we bleeding the, off of different topics the, here? Yeah, yeah, you know what? Let's... let's Segment this over here where like retro was going to be one of our topics. Yeah, I feel we're like about retro collectibles stuff. and all this kind of all fall into the same thing. But it's interesting where anything's useless as a collectible unless there's maintained interest in it over time, right? Right. But I think that people like even games that I loved growing up, they just don't hold up over time. And it's interesting to like what's what to you would be the ultimate video game collectible from you growing up something you would play and you'd want to have it again. See, I mean, f- my thing is, uh, and again, going back to the games cast, me and Andy did. I think that the greatest single video game as something that you could buy in a store mm-hmm. is the Mario All Stars Plus World okay. collection on Super Nintendo. It collected Mario One, Two, Three, World, and Lost Levels, which is the Japanese two. Great collection of games. Hold up today. They were the HD remakes of the NES ones. And that is a, a cartridge that at any point in my life, I'm like, that's a fucking classic. Yeah. Well, like, I remember as a kid growing up, now, uh, we my about- friends would have collections of comic books under their bed. Mm-hmm. And they'd like, be worth so much someday. Turned out to be true, but occasionally there's one in there that's worth a lot and a bunch that are worth nothing. And I think of like the World Championship Nintendo cartridge. Yep. There's some mm-hmm. things like that in video games that are like an individual thing that are rare, but a collection of video games over time is an interesting thing, but not something that's like this crazy thing that's increased in value because you've had this collection. And maybe it will like 20 years from now, but I thought it would be there by now. I mean, every once in a while you see like articles written up about like, this guy has every Wii game ever made. Right. And it'll be like a crazy room with all of it. And then it'll sell for something ridiculous. But a lot of times people aren't even trying to sell them. They just want to have it. Correct. And it, it goes into one of those things like Pokemon cards, right? They a fucking huge boom and these are gonna be worth so much and it's like they were worth a lot for a while and then over time it went down but there's a lot of them that are still worth a lot if you go on ebay and try to get a first edition charizard now it's still gonna go for a lot more money than a little piece of paper should go for sure yeah that kind of thing but if you have a cartridge like there's some stuff like earthbound which i think has increased in value quite a bit because it was very rare but like if you had a like if you had super mario brothers from the nes that's a that's a seminal experience for so many people. If you had one new in the box, that wouldn't be worth like fifteen hundred bucks. You know, I don't maybe think. not fifteen hundred, but I think that that still even that in box would be if we were to eBay. Like let's let's try looking now, that's like right, new in box Mario. Because I feel like even going back to like the PlayStation era, trying to buy like a Crash Bandicoot new in box, you're still gonna pay like a hundred dollars for that thing. I don't even know Super Mario Brothers new in box exists because the thing with mario is it that game got so cheap that i remember a point at funko land where they were selling the super mario bros slash duck hunt game for nine cents they were selling it for <laughs> nine cents which back then i was like what's the point <laughs> yeah like you just i could buy away. so many of these and it's just like not even a thing. so here's a guy trying to sell super mario brothers 3 Brand new Nintendo NES factory sealed two hundred ninety nine dollars. He's trying yeah. to sell it. I, I have no idea if he's going to be able to. I forgot that's how the boxes looked. Yeah, just the square rectangle. Yeah, My I thing is, that. growing up, I uh, I grew up. I was born in nineteen eighty nine, which meant that any NES game I played was like the NES was done by that time. Sure, yeah. So I had never even seen an NES box until years later because we would just buy a bunch of them at uh, garage sales and shit, yeah. and they were just loose. So I might be eating my words here. Super Mario Brothers 1, Nintendo Entertainment System, 1985. New fact, 1985? It seems like it was later than that. Mario 1 was 85. New factory sealed. It's for sale for $620. And that's always the hardest thing is like, are people actually buying these things? Because you see like, oh man, the Switch is sold out everywhere. It's selling on eBay for 
nine hundred thousand dollars. Like, no, it's not. Someone yeah. just has that number there. You know? Yeah. But here's a cartridge, Super Mario Brothers three, ten bucks. Like that's why, why still, is it yellow? That, I don't know because it's old as and hell. Why is that red? Those don't seem real. Yeah, or like a Super Mario Brothers Duck Hunt cartridge from back in the day. It's it's twenty bucks now, it's and it was less, literally it, nine cents at GameStop. Yeah, so, and it was when you bought it, it was probably fifty bucks. Yeah, I don't or know even much, more. I mean, that's yeah. thing like Earthbound was so expensive. We it's were like one hundred twenty or hundred. Like when, when it first came out, yeah, uh, I think it was 80? like ninety. I think it was like eighty or ninety. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's what just like anything, collecting something. There is an audience for that thing. Right. And if you have all of that thing, it's going to be worth it to you and maybe not anyone else. But the moment you have all of it and you say this is worth something, people are going to look at it and be like, oh, yeah, it's worth something. They have all of it. So, yeah, it was worth collecting for them. It's like Earthbound. We were talking this being a huge collectible. Earthbound uncut, complete box set, new sealed SNES, 80 bucks. I would have thought that would have been like 1200. But then what's this one? See, these are reproductions. Something about this seems off. Five hundred dollars? Questionable. We're just sitting here. We're this is show where we look at a laptop. It. This now. is the one that I'm seeing. Yeah. That's four thousand. Like the four thousand dollars one. That's the giant box. That is the actual Earthbound box. From Super back Nintendo in the day. SNES Earthbound, new in box, brand new in original box. VGA Q85. I'm sure that means something to someone. <laughs> four thousand dollars. Very good. Oh, oh. <laughs> good job, Earthbound. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. It's interesting because, like, I held on to, I mean, I still have so many physical games, and at some point I had to, yeah. I traded them in to get the next console because that's how things worked um, in the 90s. But I still hold on to a couple physical games. Like, there's some things that I'm like, this meant something to me, so I'm never going to get rid of it. But I knew, I'm like, I can't go down this collecting rabbit hole because I will. I'll go crazy and mm-hmm. I'll buy all of them. And I think that we're lucky that we are able to have things like virtual console and the PlayStation Network and backwards compatibility, like being able to download stuff on Xbox. It's like my where, Super Mario World for the 40th time. Yeah. Exactly. But having it all in one place, it's like the dream used to be, oh man, I wish I had arcade cabinets. But it's like, you really, you just want yeah. one thing where you can play all of all the Everything games. ever, yeah. yeah. Great. It'd be the greatest. The digital collecting is something that I get involved with where it's like, oh, I, you know, I, I don't like to physically collect stuff or like knickknacks, I know that's a big thing in the tech industry to have stuff on your yeah. on your desk. I can't stand that. I want a clean workspace. But digital stuff, I'll just have archives of everything. And and if I get one thing, I've got to get the rest of it. That's why yeah, I like dude, achievements like on the too, Xbox man. platform. Oh, I yeah. get that one achievement. I'm like, well, I'm playing this game for the next eight years until I get all oh of them. Oh, my God. And do you think we're going the that route with Amiibo right now? Yeah, definitely. That's why I'm like, I can't buy an Amiibo. And whenever like people send us Amiibos, I'm like, I nope. Need Keep this thing away from, away from me because I'll just get addicted to it. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want that because once I have one, I need them all. Because then you get the you get on that hunt where you find out about the super rare one, which yeah. I don't know what the really rare amiibo is right now, but you want that fucking item and it's on eBay for I don't know sixty bucks, which you know isn't crazy, but it's like more than I want to spend for a fucking plastic toy that yeah. I'm probably not going to give a shit about in five years. But let me tell you why you would because uh, Mario Kart just came out recently came out on the Nintendo Switch. It was Amiibo enabled. Mm-hmm. And so Caden, who has a full collection of Amiibos, she brought them into the know and everybody unlocked every possible character yeah. on Mario Kart day one. So she's the hot business. She, has, she could have had a whole little business going on there. That's how it was. Stored with- money from people. <laughs> I yeah. like the way you oh, think. Yeah. yeah, just be like, Renting hey, you want to come by and rent out these Amiibo? Leasing get them out. Yeah. Let me see oh, this. That's a good yeah. deal. So what's the most expensive Amiibo since we're in, the, in this trend? Uh, for a while, it was that gold. It was, I think, gold the Golden Mario, Mario right? one, yeah. right? Well, I know also the 8-bit ones were also, like, very limited when they sold 22 them. bucks. Maybe it wasn't Golden Mario. There was no, some Mario. A, I think it was the 8-bit Mario. It might have like, been Silver Mario, not the 8-bit. Or maybe there's an unpainted Mario. Was that one? Am I, I thinking know. about it right? Anyway, no idea. <laughs> the one thing about retro too is, as I mean, you make a lot of video game content. We make a lot of video game content, and we're constantly asked when we talk about your shows, "Will you guys make a retro show?" But retro shows to me are so hard because everyone's version of retro is different. Like my number one collectible that I would love to have, which I actually do have, um, is a cloth map from the game series Ultima. If you know what that is, oh, it's, yeah. yeah, the original like RPG like series on the Commodore. Yeah, it was a Commodore game, and it was uh, you had a map the the of this you know World Britannia that they invented for the game. But I, most people who were watching this and who watch Rush, you don't they never played any Ultima games. Yeah. They don't care. They might have played Ultima online, you yeah. know, which is a totally different game. But they yeah. just they, they couldn't care less about it. And then you know somebody who's watching it to them. Some people who who watch our shows now, retro to them is the original Halo. 
Yeah. You know, because they, they started playing at Halo 3 or something like that. And so it's like, to me, that I, I, I was a full-grown adult playing Halo. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, see, that's, that's interesting because what I was saying about I, there's a couple games that I kept the physical versions of. Halo and Halo 2 are examples of that because yeah. I'll never forget where I was playing those games mm-hmm. and the experiences I had. So that steel case Halo 2. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the limited edition on the one. Yeah. Something about it, I'm just like, I'm never getting rid of this thing. Like, this means something to me. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't give a fuck if it, it's worth anything. Like, it's worth sentimental value. I have a couple of those sealed at home. Oh, yeah? Yeah, they have, like, the don't open until whatever day. Until release, yeah. Yeah, until, like, November 5th, 2005. My brother and I cut school, I believe. And that's my brother. I got my brother really into video games. Like, he had fallen off for quite a bit after playing NES and SNES for quite a, quite some time. And he jumped back in on Halo, and he was awful at the, at the start <laughs> of it. But then he eventually started getting good. And the most annoying thing for me was, like, when I would work all day at my job, like... At, my after school job and I'd come home my brother would be in my room like playing Halo with my friends I'd be like alright get the fuck out of my room dude <laughs> like what are you doing and so yeah, I remember he drove me to the Best Buy to get Halo like launch day this is so fucking great dude what a great memory yeah. Halo 2 new in the box goes for $22 goes for less than what you paid for it back then yeah what about the collectors? <laughs> All right, let's find out. The collectors Collector edition. steel case. Limited, I, I limited edition is I think what they call it oh. I think the video game industry unlike any other industry and Nintendo's a great example of this. They have the ability to cash in on that retro kind of nostalgia that people want by just making newer versions of the game. And Nintendo, everybody was going nuts on the Switch for this new Zelda game. Everybody I know says it's one of the best games ever. And I think the thing that makes it that way is because it plays like a Zelda game that they remember as a kid. It's light years ahead of it, but it's the way you remember it and you like kind of grow that memory and you add to it yourself. It's like, it doesn't play the way the old game plays. It just plays the way you remember it. Yeah, and, and well, that is the the importance of nailing nostalgia. We actually talked about this. I talked with Ashley about this on uh, Glitch Please over uh-huh. on Rooster Teeth first. You can check that out. JoeRooster.com. Yes, uh, and uh, we, t- we were talking about that and how it's like the, the Lara Croft Go games nail classic Tomb Raider the way that you remember those games playing because yep. you go back to those games now and it's just like what this is this is so bad so hard to control and like, pyramid what's... boobs yeah yeah exactly Collector's edition seven bucks seven oh bucks <laughs> there you go but man that thing's sexy yeah uh, in- invest in something else <laughs> but the thing with Nintendo that I think that uh that they have that was unique to them for a very long time in the the video game industry that now PlayStation is finally kind of kind of has like PlayStation has been on for 20 years. Yeah. So they now have a stable of franchises and characters that people grew up on. And I feel like Xbox. Sure. Yeah. Is it Xbox is more about the experience and less about the games themselves. I think where there's like, you know, Halo and Master Chief and all that great and people have their memories, but people don't necessarily talk about the memories of Halo. They talk about the memories of the sleepovers they had and the land parties they had and things like that. Whereas I, with Nintendo, it's the characters. You know, yeah. with with PlayStation, it's well, Nintendo like crushes that first party franchises. Yeah, they crush it. And yeah. when it comes to nostalgia, like Pokemon, right, came out when I was in third grade, and I there's nothing I'm more nostalgic for than the original gens of Pokemon. Mm-hmm. There are kids now. There are seven generations of kids that grew up with a different generation of Pokemon that have that same feeling for those Pokemon. Right. You know, Nintendo just does the same thing over and over, but it's always to a new audience. Yeah. Like I, I'm always amazed. We worked with a guy who his first Star Wars movies he ever saw were the original trilogy, and he's like, these are the greatest movies ever. And You mean the prequel trilogy? Yeah, well, I'd say the original. Yeah, yeah, I meant the one through three. I meant yeah. the, the yeah, newer, yeah, yeah. the prequel trilogy. Yeah, I'm talking about Blanchard. He, is that serious? Is he... Is no, he ingest? genuinely likes them. I think he genuinely likes those movies. Genuinely likes or genuinely liked? No, those he, are different statements. No, he has he has made a little bit of a turn. Okay, and where he realized, oh, maybe these movies aren't great. Because I mean, I grew up with them too. I'd seen oh, the originals yeah, first, yeah. but yep. like going, I remember going to the theaters and watching one and two and and three, and not. I mean, I was a dumb kid, so episode one to me, I was like, dude, the pod racing was episode cool. Darth Maul had a fucking incredible dual sided lightsaber. Are you fucking kidding me? They spoiled it in the trailer. Yeah. What was that about? Never but, understood that. Hype. <laughs> episode one was great to me, but you need hype for the new Star Wars movie after <laughs> twenty years. Not. Even episode two to me was like, I'm still young, but even I, I know that this is not a good movie at all. My brother and I were so bummed out See, in the theater. Watching two for me, I was young to the point that like Yoda pulled out his lightsaber. Yoda's gonna fucking fight. Oh my god! And but then it's like so years later, I grew up. I'm like, wow, what bad character development? Yeah. Why would they I, do all I, that? I, I was in the movie going. What the the Buddha character has a lightsaber and is jumping around fighting it's a stuff? Tiny lightsaber. That's and he not puts what he around. does. It was he's very so strange. Slow, but he's so to fast. Me. Yeah, 
But everyone in the theater was going, oh my god, I'm like, this is totally out of character. This is yeah. so off-brand for Yoda. But uh, yeah, GoldenEye for the Nintendo 64. Great retro game. Yeah. You would never want to play that game today. But it's, you know, 30 bucks. And yeah. so many people would identify that as one of the greatest games to ever be put out for a console. And it, playing it now is rough. <laughs> it's rough, hard. Man. It's hard. It had paintball mode, though. It did. It did. It had the golden gun mode, which and I really golden liked. And golden, I think, yeah. goes back to what I was saying about kind of what Xbox has going for it, where it was about the experience more than the game itself. I think you're right. You know, with golden, it was, it was no about... No one else could do FPS on a console until golden, I kind of did it right, and then I give Halo a lot of credit for getting it right in the Call of Duty. I mean, the way I see it is golden, I kind of made it fun for coach couch co-op uh, to be able to just play, or not even co-op, just multiplayer, and play with people in a room and have it be fun. And that they perfectly nailed the one more match, one more match, sure. one more match mentality. And then meanwhile, on PC side, of course, they, they there was so many great first-person shooters, but a lot of them were story-based. And then there was the Unreals, and there was Counter-Strike, which like they had totally had their thing going, right? Mm. But N64 still just had the, hey, it's just fun to control, and it only had one analog, and there's no way this will be good. And it wasn't until um, that team went off and did Time Splitters where they did the dual analog thing on PlayStation 2, and then Halo came in and were like, oh, no, we, we're going to do this right. Yeah. And like they just knocked it out Fucking of the park. Fucking nailed it, yeah. yeah. You know what's going to be interesting to me for retro going forward is the generation of people who are growing up playing video games now, a lot of those experiences, what you talked about with your couch co-op was your buddy next to you, now that's your online friends. Yep. And like I think about a game like Five Nights at Freddy's, I cannot separate that from Markiplier. Mm. So when people like you know, twenty years from now remember this game, you know Five Nights at Freddy's, I don't know what Mark will be doing twenty years from now. But hopefully he'll be happily retired or something like that. But people will be their retro experience will be thinking about that personality that they experienced it with. I didn't really have that growing up. I had my mm. buddies that I played games with, my buddy Randy that I played Ultima with. Yeah. But I didn't have these personalities that then go off and do other things. And it's like they're tied into that experience. I'm curious to see how that'll be in, yeah. in a couple decades. I mean, I, I've already lived through enough of that to see such a change where it's like I have my friends that I played Smash Brothers with or, you know, what Mario Kart or whatever. And then my buddy Alfredo, he got so into uh, the online first person shooter thing in the MLG way and in the clan battles and in all that stuff. Stuff. And I'd be hanging out with him, and he's talking about all these friends he has. And I'm like, "Who are these people? I go to school with you." Yeah. And he's like, "No, nah, man, these are people I just play with online." Yeah. And like, they would meet up and hang out, and then like and to then see your what friendship we, was over. Yeah, no, it, <laughs> dude. That junior year of high school almost destroyed me and Alfredo because Counter Strike just took over his life. When it came to Xbox, he just. Yeah, was gone. Do we have any piano music we can yeah. play here? No, you know, like, sad. Play, play the leftovers music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, no, it was crazy, man. But then, but he did that, and then he introduced me to this whole group of, of friends that he had. I remember we went down and stayed with his online friends in LA. Yeah, and we just had a place to stay, and it was, we had an awesome time. Terrible idea, by the way. I know. Yeah, but now, but now it's, just, it's kind of a normal thing. Like when when we do like community events, like kind of funny live or any like we just go to PAX or whatever. There's a bunch of the community. It's, with like 12 people in a hotel room yeah. and I'm like that sounds like a disaster been there, yeah. yeah yeah been there but five people in the hotel room six people listen it smells gross he was coming up for kind of funny live too and we were we had just arrived from Austin and we were all going to the hotel I said where are you staying and he goes I'm staying in a and a, a fan let me sleep on the floor in like a room with 18 other people. And I said, I'm getting you a hotel Shout room. Shout out to Trevor Starkey. <laughs> I know that you were not on the official list of traveling people for Alex this. Aziz. But I'm getting you a hotel room so you don't have to stay on the floor. Oh, man. <laughs> and I appreciate it, man. It, man. Apparently, apparently you did. That's why you quit. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the hotel room. I'm out. Ah. <laughs> Little did I know I was funding his recruitment at uh, Kind of Funny there at the time. Go. Oh man, the I'm seeds sorry. were planted early. I'm sorry, we, we stole them from you guys. <laughs> it happened. That was a whole did. thing where it was just like, as we were talking about it, we did, we came to a decision at an Outback Steakhouse. As good decisions are always made. Uh, when me and Kevin were like, we want Andy. Like Andy's the dude that we want for this this role. And I was like, oh man. Like, See, and that's important is... because we never said that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, turn about his fair play. Greg is not getting married today. He's packing to move to Austin. <laughs> and we're going to announce that. Greg Miller's moving over to Rooster. That's what I was oh, saying. Yes. I think the the on the drive over here, he was on a flight to Austin to go record stuff with you all. And uh, and somebody was like, man, uh, did, like, what's, did you all trade spots? I was like, man, Rooster Teeth got fucked. Or no, <laughs> kind of funny got fucked with this trade. Like, yeah. they totally yeah, got me. ripped off. Or me or you? <laughs> me. <laughs> like, <laughs> But like, one of our, our first things with that was we were like, all right, we got to talk to Rooster Teeth. We got to talk to everyone at Rooster Teeth that might 
be upset about this and see if they're cool with it. So we hit you up. We yeah. hit Jeff. We hit uh, our friend Lewis and um, a couple other people. And it went all the way up. We ended up talking to Matt. <laughs> we ended up talking to, to Ezra, who was like full screen and all that shit. So I'm like, man, it went up there. Well, we had to talk to the guy that Andy actually worked for, which is the head of the games yeah, division. Michael. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he was... He might he might not be your best friend. He was very sad. Yeah. No, I mean he's an awesome man. We've talked many times since then. And I don't know what he said. I'm just saying you were you were a valuable employee and Michael Michael misses you. I know. I yeah, I miss them too. I miss them too. Yeah. (laughs) But I I went to this what's that? That life's over, Andy. Kevin yeah. tells me everybody back home is dead. Forget about them. They're, yeah, they're gone. It's, 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 you gotta do it. You're dead to me. So I, I think I wrote that on Twitter. Good <laughs> you luck. Did. Good luck. You're dead to me. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I did the same thing too. Um, even though it was pretty clear that Meg Turney was going to come and work at Rooster Teeth, I called Phil DeFranco and told him. I said, I said, listen, it's really rare that someone of the caliber of Meg Turney moves to Austin. So we're probably going to offer her a job. And I wasn't asking for permission, yeah, you know, because that's between us and Meg and Meg makes her own decisions in her career and makes very good ones. Uh, but I, you know, with, I just wanted to give him a heads up. You know yeah. what I mean? And you have to be kind of careful about that too. I, you know, puts the employee in a great position because then the current employer might go, Hey, we want to keep you exactly, you know, and that kind of thing. But especially if you know, people, you want to be able to make sure that you do that kind of thing because that can you can go back and forth on that and it gets crazy in the Absolutely. Heartbeat. I mean, it sounds super corny to say, but every relationship requires communication. You know, yeah. and it's just like I feel like any even business relationships, it's like you need to make sure that you're communicating what your side of the story is because Otherwise, they're going to think they're going to come up with their own version of what your story is. And they're going to look at it more as, oh, they're fucking us instead of, oh, no, this is just a total, you know, a business decision that is being made because people believe this is the right thing to do or, or whatever it is. You're going to end up in the same rooms again at some point. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's also like there's no reason to bite the hand that feeds when it comes to opportunities and stuff like that. So it's just like we definitely do not want to have a bad relationship with you guys like that'd be so stupid yeah. but no or, or but if you can screw over somebody you hate then that's then, good. Then you're, then that's you're the great. win-win well how have you, you seen kind a of- party and you're like hey thanks for watching this episode of the game over greggy show click here to subscribe click here to support us on patreon click here to see other episodes click here to go into a portal to take you to kind of funny games i'm greg kind of i kind of made all this happen but i mean not in like a conceited way i'm just saying if i didn't want to do the oreo show ever then it would have never happened i hope kevin isn't mad at me you mad at me kevin